Um, good evening, everyone. Um, I'm Vicki Bloom. I'm Dean of the Library here at IUSB. And I want to thank you all for coming tonight to see our speaker and our Vonnegut exhibit, uh, which is um, in our opening event, which is this, the talk is Vonnegut and Anthropology on the Cat's Cradle of Human Sociopolitics. And I don't know if you saw it, but one of the things that was sent out uh, recently um, highlighting this uh, talk, it had anthropology. So I, I really loved that, all right. Anyways, tonight's speaker is Dr. Joshua Wells. He's Assistant Professor of Archaeology and Social Informatics uh, in the Department of Sociology and Anthropology. He has a PhD from Indiana University Bloomington. His research interests include cultural landscapes, digital data practices, human technology interaction, and technology-enabled active learning. Dr. Wells' talk tonight will focus on Vonnegut's life, his work, with anthropology and the ways in which his writing reflects anthro anthropological concepts of politics and humor, all through the lens of A Man Without a Country, a book which he nominated for our campus theme this year um, on Politics is Everywhere. At the end of the event, uh, could you please take a few minutes to fill out your evaluation form? We use those, uh, the feedback, to plan future events. And just before I close here, before turning this over to Dr. Wells, we are going to have another speaker event on Wednesday, March 20th, again at 5.30. 5.30 seems to be our time. And it's called Islamic Extremism, Myth or Reality by Dr. Omar. He's a scholar of Islamic studies and peace building at University of Notre Dame. This is in conjunction with a grant the library won uh, for Muslim materials. Uh, so we're very excited about that as well. Anyways, I hope you'll join us after the event to look at the exhibit. Part of it is also downstairs on the first floor and to enjoy our light refreshments. And uh, I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Wells now. Hello. Let's see. I always overpack. Let's see. Now I'll warn you straight away. The power, the uh, slideshow here um, bears direct, but not uh, temporally correlated relations to what I'm speaking about. Um, you'll probably see everything twice, but I thought that uh, you know, doing something atemporal felt Vonnegut-esque, so I can get away with it. I'd like to uh, thank Vicki and Julie Elliott and Allison Stankrauf and Elizabeth Benyon for uh, making this all possible. When I saw uh, the Kurt Vonnegut Memorial Library's announcement about their traveling exhibit last summer. Uh, I just uh, whipped off a Facebook share <laughs> to them and said, hey, wouldn't it be great if we, got the, if we got this for the campus theme next year? And suddenly it happened. Um, so, you know, the only thing I did with this was, uh, you know, repost. And it'd be, um, so, I mean, honestly, this, this is wonderful. Thank you, thank you very much. Um, what I wanna talk about here tonight uh, involves uh, a Man Without a Country, and you'll see a number of the frontispieces of uh, Vonnegut's artwork that appear in it uh, popping up here and there throughout, uh, throughout the show. And a great, um, oh, about half of the, the discussion in here is uh, actually taken also from Dan Wakefield's new book, Kurt Vonnegut Letters, um, which, I think, which I think is pretty great. In fact, the uh, the discussion of anthropology in here combined with uh, other interviews that Vonnegut's done and my discussions with uh, alums from the University of Chicago uh, have sort of led me to an interesting, uh, to an interesting take on this, uh, which, which I suppose now that Vonnegut's dead I can also get away with. Um, you, you, I'm sure you're all familiar with, you know, the, Mar with the Mark Twain reenactment 
uh, co concept. Well, I'm not going to. Uh, well, I'm not going to put on a Mark Twain wig and pretend I'm, and pretend I'm Kurt Vonnegut. Although, you could probably get away with that too. Um, but I am going to. Uh, I am going to. Uh, you know, liberally quote from a number of his letters at the time because, frankly, uh, I, I feel I don't have the hubris or skill uh, to reparaphrase what Vonnegut says so well in his, in the. In the, in, you know, the primary sources anyway. Uh, so I'll be reading a lot, of his, uh, a lot of his letters pertaining to his graduate work and his anthropological concepts in general. Um, so, you know, I'm sure you're all uh, at least basically familiar with Vonnegut, born 1922, died 2007, uh, 20th century American writer and 21st century. You know, uh, his, wor his work le works like Slaughterhouse-Five, Breakfast of Champions, and of course, Cat's Cradle, which uh, became his honorary master's thesis at the University of Chicago, are all terrific uh, satirical uh, bits of fiction, science fiction, uh, however you want to categorize them. Uh, he was also uh, a prominent supporter of the ACLU, uh, a honorary president of the American Humanist Union, which I believe he took over after Isaac Asimov, which is pretty neat. Um, and of course, his final book, A Man Without a Country, is our text for the One Book, One Campus event this year. And I recommended that to go along with this exhibit simply because I felt, uh, I felt that it offered a much broader cross-section of, of everything Vonnegut ever thought about, which in anthropological terms is kind of fitting because anthropology takes the idea of holism, trying to look at the entire human experience and, cat and categorize it. So rather than just simply focusing on uh, war or strange facets of future human evolution, I thought that Vonnegut's essays uh, reflecting on a life lived among human beings seemed the most anthropological. Uh, so, uh, so, you know, an important feature in many political cultures, and certainly American politics, is to entertain absurdity and humor as relief valves for people to broach ideas that can't be aired in seriousness, or uh, at least are uh, dangerous to. Uh, and of course, what one faction considers appropriately absurd and bitingly hilarious uh, might positively be anathema to another. Uh, and Kurt Vonnegut, uh, a Hoosier, uh, can certainly provide a unique and timely example of, of this uh, through the late 20th and early 21st century uh, with his strange, scathing, and sometimes scandalous works. Um, you know, it's unlikely that a reader could encounter Vonnegut, and especially a man without a country, without developing a strong opinion or at least a, a strong sentiment on some topic of the day. Uh, you know, rereading it, uh, you know, just before getting in here, of course, it seemed, it seemed, uh, you know, still very timely, even after seven whole years, eight years now. Yeah, but <laughs> um, I think it may well end up being timeless. I look forward to my to my grandchildren someday seeing a Kurt Vonnegut reenactor at the library. Be. But little, the perhaps little-known fact among Kurt Vonnegut for many people is that he was also an anthropologist. Uh, he sometimes called himself an anthropologist, more often called himself a student of anthropology. And we see this uh, first and foremost in uh, oftentimes seen forward to Slaughterhouse-Five, where he, where he wrote, I think about my education sometimes. I went to the University of Chicago for a while after the Second World War. I was a student in the Department of Anthropology. At that time, they were teaching that there was absolutely no difference between anybody. They may be teaching that still. Another thing they taught was that no one was ridiculous or bad or disgusting. Shortly before my father died, he said to me, you know, you never wrote a story with a villain in it. And I told him that was one of the things I learned in college after the war. Maybe. So Vonnegut and his wife Jane were accepted into the graduate programs at, at uh, U of Chicago in 1945, and he spent the next couple of years pursuing coursework in an MA. Of course, it would take much longer than that. And the anthropologists who dealt uh, with Kurt Vonnegut the most uh, appear to have been you know, Robert, uh, Robert Redfield, uh, who is known as uh, who's known as a, an innovator in mid-century anthropology who emphasized uh, that anthropology really stood astride the breach that separated historical and scientific inquiry. Uh, Sidney Slotkin, his advisor, 
who was an innovator of empirical sociocultural systematic theories. Sol Tax, who was a foundational practitioner of action anthropology uh, to solve real world problems for real people on the ground. Uh, Fred Egan, the a foundational practitioner of what's called the eclectic approach that combines functional studies of sociocultural behavior with, hi uh, with history. And Ray Fogelson, uh, who, uh, who, uh, ended, who ended up approving uh, Vonnegut, uh, Vonnegut's uh, Cat's Cradle for a Thesis, who was also a foundational practitioner of ethnohistory. Now, Vonnegut had been on the books as an MA student for quite some time in the late, uh, by the time the late 60s rolled around. Uh, so those of you who have been to graduate school, you know, you can do the math. He was, he was one of us. <laughs> Maybe those of you who are on your way to graduate school, take heart. You too can be a success, even after 20 years. Um, but you know, he. But you know, in '65 and '66, uh, when they passed Vonnegut's uh, file on to Ray Fogelson, uh, who was the most junior faculty member at the time, uh, you know, the theses that Vonnegut had been turning in uh, were just thoroughly antiquated in his in the ways he approached the discussion of, anthrop uh, of anthropological concepts. He, he seemed to have a really good grasp uh, on all of the literature of the time. He, he, he passed exams well, he wrote proposals well. It was just getting that final, that final thesis finished that seemed to be the real problem. Uh, but uh, Ray Fogelson and one of the deans hit on the idea of allowing Cat's Cradle to be an MA thesis, uh, and they still have one sitting in their thesis room in Haskell Hall. And in later writings, Vonnegut admitted that he hadn't been the most diligent student. Uh, he wrote, uh, in, he wrote uh, later on uh, that, it, that he wrote the master's thesis in about two weeks uh, when he owed it to them for 18 years. Uh, he called them up when it was done, and they, and they said, I could have the degree if it was any good. It might be good. It's about how a storyteller, any good storyteller, anywhere, works. Uh, he wrote later on in, in 77, uh, in retrospect, about coming up with the idea in the first place, I worked it up with Dr. Sidney Slotkin, a brilliant and neurotic member of the department, who was not well thought of and who was on his way out. He was disreputable for relating primitive societies to industrialized societies and for wanting to study them in parallel. My thesis proposal was rejected for being such a scheme, and he had more influence on me than anybody else there, but remained quite cold to me. I visited him a couple of times before leaving. He didn't seem to remember me and was eager for me to leave again. He finally, he finally committed suicide by swallowing cyanide. Love to Lori. Cheers, Kurt. <laughs> and that, and that un, um, un, is the unfortunate truth. Uh, Slotkin, uh, while a, a brilliant young mind, was apparently quite troubled. Uh, his, his obituary by Soul Tax um, in, in an anthropological journal uh, wrote a lot of great things about uh, about his promise, but also uh, you know his uh, uh, em his embattled psyche toward the end. Um, and but nevertheless, it seems that uh, that Slotkin remain Slotkin and the other faculty there remained a really strong influence on Vonnegut throughout his writing, uh, even as he grew really really angry with the University of Chicago. You know, uh, shortly after he got the got the M.A. Uh, he wrote, uh, he, he wrote, uh, quote unquote, the University of Chicago can take a flying fuck at the moon. Um, those of you who have read, uh, you know, Slaughterhouse Five and a few of his other books know he, he really liked to use that exact phrase when somebody was particularly angry about something, um, and it kind of sounds that way. Um, but Slotkin's influence. Uh, and, uh, and that of others, still, re still really hung with him, no matter how he felt about uh, you know, the, the structure of, of UC anyway. Um, he, he wrote to another, as he wrote to a, a friend in the 50s, uh, sort of while it was still all, all fresh, I thought rather fuzzily about something I wanted to add to my recent letter to you, about this business of the school, schools of painting, schools of poetry, schools of music, schools of writing. For a couple of years after the war, I was a graduate student uh, in anthropology at UC, and at the instigation of a bright and neurotic instructor named Slotkin, I got interested in the notion of the school. I'll explain what this means in a minute. 
and decided to do a thesis on the subject. I wrote about 40 pages of the thing based on the Cubist school in Paris and got told by the faculty I'd better pick something strictly more anthropological. They suggested firmly that I interest myself in the Indian ghost dance of 1894. Shortly thereafter, I ran out of money and I signed on with General Electric. I never did get past the note-taking stage on the ghost dance business, albeit damn interesting. Uh, keep in mind, this is what he was writing about 18 years later for two weeks. But Slotkin's notion of the importance of the school stuck with me, and it now seems pertinent to anybody whose literary fortunes we take an interest in. What Slotkin said was this, no man who achieved greatness in the arts operated by himself. He was the top man in a group of like-minded individuals. This works out fine for the Cubists, and Slotkin had plenty of good evidence for applying to Goh, Thoreau, Hemingway, and just about anybody you care to name. If it isn't 100% true, it's true enough to be interesting and maybe helpful. The school gives a man, Slotkin said, the fantastic amount of guts it takes to add to culture. It gives him morale, esprit de corps, and the resources of many brains, and maybe most important, one-sidedness one with assurance. My reporting what Slotkin said four years ago is pretty subjective, so let's say that Vonnegut, a Slotkin derivative, is saying this. About this one-sidedness, I'm convinced that no one can amount to a damn in the arts if he becomes sweetly reasonable, seeing all sides of a picture and forgiving all sins. Now, that, now there I can see Vonnegut really running into, uh, running into some of the uh, uh, difficulties with faculty there talking about cultural relativism, uh, but I digress. Anyway, uh, as Slotkin said, these things are group products. It isn't a question of finding a messiah, but a group's creating one, and it's hard work. It takes a while. And if Slotkin's right, maybe the death of the institution of friendship is the death of the innovation in the arts. Uh, and uh, and uh, so forth. You know, he really took this, uh, this idea of, uh, of uh, you know, group, of group achievement, of, uh, of a kind of zeitgeist to heart. Uh, and beyond that, Vonnegut took a lot of other elements of American anthropology to heart. You know, American anthropology... Uh, has what, what are generally referred to as four subfields that make it up. There, there's sociocultural anthropology, which probably most people are, are most immediately familiar with because it has the word anthropology in it. Uh, you know, that's, that's the, the work of Margaret Mead, uh, Ru Ruth Benedict, uh, all, all your famous people who go, out, uh, who go out some other part of the world and live with people and write, and write big books about them. And that's still a big part of anthropology. Sociocultural anthropology studies living people in the, pre, uh, in the present day and how their, and how their uh, social, uh, social uh, structures and beliefs help them get by. There's linguistic anthropology, which studies the symbolism that allows people to communicate ideas which builds, the, which builds those cultural values, which builds those social structures. There's archeology. span uh, American archeology span is truly the sociocultural anthropology of the past. Uh, all the, uh, after the people are gone, all that remains is archeology. span uh, And there's bioanthropology or physical anthropology as it was more commonly called in Vonnegut's day, which was, which was the Bio, is the biological study of the human species as an organism. Uh, many bioanthropologists, physical anthropologists, uh, also work side by side in the, uh, with the medical field or forensics, uh, or today in uh, you know, human genetics. Uh, but it's actually the the, uh, the that aspect of physical anthropology, which also uh, played a big part in in some of, in a great deal of Vonnegut's thinking. Um, for instance, he wrote to a friend in 1980, uh, curious about, uh, about uh, the, the growth in, holo in Holocaust studies and how World War II was becoming an academic phenomenon. And he, and he wrote uh, uh, that, according, that he felt that Holocaust studies, with the best possible intentions, were in danger of making reputable the quack physical anthropology and cultural anthropology of Hitler's time. Uh, Hitler had emotional reasons for wishing to make Jews easily distinguished from the general population of Europe, and no reputable scientist then or now would make such a distinction. 
when I, Vonnegut, studied anthropology at Chicago, I was told there's no way that, that Jewish people could be described or identified. They were Europeans physically, intellectually. Their skeletons and skulls were just more Europeans. Their life stories were just more European life stories. And the only way Hitler could find Jews to kill, finally, was to go looking for people who said they were Jews. Hitler made a hard, harmless admission a capital crime. And it should be remembered, remembered that once his quack anthropologists got to work seeking distinctions, that they were able to generalize loathsomely about Slavs and blacks and gypsies and homosexuals and on and on. And any responsible study of that time should begin with, should begin with the question, well what, is, well, what is a Jew? And it should be said there is no scientific answer and there isn't a scientific answer. And any other reply has its roots in superstition. And, and in writing about that, you know, he followed up uh, closer to the end of his life uh, on a 1989 trip to Mozambique, where he wrote that in the midst of the, that terrible civil war there, which was 22 years long at the point he got there, if you color the people in old photographs of Auschwitz, shades for brown and black, you'd hardly, you would see what was commonly seen in Mozambique. And I found myself crying so hard that I was barking like a dog. I didn't come close to doing that after World War II. The last time I cried, and I did it quietly, and I didn't bark like a dog, was that when my first wife, Jane, died. And it, it just seemed to me reading that, that the, the idea, that anthropological ideal of the, the species unity, the mental unity of humankind, I mean, that stuck with Vonnegut. And it really kept with him through his life. And you can see it in a number of essays uh, in, in the, the Man Without a Country. And you can see it in a lot of his other writings as well, too. It's, it's something I think he lived. Um, you know, it shows up in, all, in his political activism, et cetera. Um, you know, and we can see, too, I think, the ideas of political action theory and politic and... Uh, uh, and applied anthropology in general that Sol Tax and some of the others at the University of Chicago were beginning to articulate, showing up in Cat's Cradle, showing up in, uh, of course, A Man Without a Country. And I think one of the reasons they took Cat's uh, Cradle as a formal thesis has to do uh, with, the, with the discussion or with uh, his invention of, of Bokanism, uh, the, the invented religion. Uh, that's a central part of Cat's Cradle. You know, Bokanism uh, was created by a character in, by a character in the novel uh, who, was, who, was, who, who was renamed himself uh, the Prophet Bokanan, uh, of course, but who was born Lionel Boyd Johnson and attended the London School of Economics to, to study political science. Uh, but then he moved to the Caribbean island nation of San Lorenzo, fictional. Uh, and created the Bokanism religion, and in the meantime, and in the meantime, uh, a sci uh, scientists uh, relocating to San Lorenzo accidentally destroy the world through uh, through run through run amok investigations of materials that turn all of the world's water into ice. Um, so I think the the uh, concepts of runaway science and the concept of of somebody building a religion, uh, which at the same uh, which at the same time serves as a meaningful way for people, uh, in uh, Vonnegut in Vonnegut's description, to escape uh, the difficulties of their re of their reality by practicing uh, some by practicing some useful rituals, but which could be outlawed and persecuted on their island by the government, uh, all served in a functional way. Uh, to keep the whole process going and give everyone a reason uh, to exist in the San Lorenzo culture that he created. Um, the, uh, you know, so the lure of Bokanism was a kind of was a kind of forbidden fruit, and it seemed and it seemed to work, and he, uh, and he got away with it. Uh, but in real life, you know, you know, beyond Bokanism as as this school as this zeitgeist that he got from Slotkin and the others. Uh, you know, he, there uh, there are a number of elements of that that show up in in Vonnegut's examinations of himself later on. Um, for instance, in the in the late 80s, uh, he was discussing 
a PhD thesis uh, by, uh, by an author named William Coe about violence in, in American humor and, quote, he examines Mark Twain, Ambrose Bierce, Ring Lardner, and myself. The others wound up in despair over human nature, he says, and he implies that I can scarcely do otherwise. One, <laughs> one possible escape route's open to me, however, which was not evident to the other three, and that's the extraordinarily important idea that I only now understand, which I picked up from anthropology. Culture is a gadget, which can be tinkered with like a Model T Ford. Our President Reagan, this was 1987, uh, supposes that his brain is producing his opinions. His brain is, in fact, soaked in a culture, and he's never bothered to examine its ingredients. He oozes rather than thinks. It, it would be interesting to imagine a, a Vonnegut uh, reenactor re and a, a Reagan reenactor, perhaps, sharing a library space. But that's a talk for another time. It was an easy jump to, uh, to believe, as I do, that culture can contain fatal poisons which can be identified. Respect for firearms, for example, or the belief that no male is really a man until he has a physical showdown of some kind, or that women can't possibly understand the really important things which are going on, and so on. What could be, what could be simpler, or perhaps more simple-minded? Yeah, and I think we can contrast you know, the, those kinds of sentiments that that, uh, that Vonnegut's stating there, with uh, you know the more famous, with the more famous quote by say Margaret Mead, uh, which often finds its way onto T-shirts and posters, you know, never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it's the only thing that ever has. Um, contra uh, Vonnegut continuing on. Uh, I was taught that messing up somebody's culture was like messing with his or her liver or pancreas. It's not so. Good news. <laughs> um, you know, and, it, and it's pretty obvious that Vonnegut had these ideas even, even pretty early on. You know, he, um, after he finished his coursework uh, in anthropology in the, late for, in the late 40s, he applied to General Motors, uh, touting, uh, touting his, mat, his, uh, up, his soon, soon to be uh, accomplished master's degree in anthropology only 20 years too soon um, as, uh, uh, as qualifications for, uh, for a job. And he wrote, anthropology is a, tool, is a tool which is really good at getting what we call the native perspective or the user, uh, 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 oh, whoops, wrong quote there. <laughs> the study of the science of man has been extremely satisfactory from, that, from a personal viewpoint. And it should make me valuable to an organization such as General Motors, for I have considerable insight through training in cultural anthropology into human relations and would, with some instruction, make an able personnel or labor relations man. And this is actually, uh, he presages uh, some discussions by anthropologists working for General Motors almost exactly 60 years later uh, who wrote that anthropology as a tool is really good at getting what we call the native perspective or the user opinion. We're able to recognize conflict and guide plant managers in Detroit on how to effectively communicate with their employees. Uh, so it sort of begs the question if Vonnegut had, uh, you know, had had a uh, a, a deeper relationship with his advisor, if he'd, uh, you know, been, if he'd been uh, mentored with others, you know, where, where would applied anthropology be today? Probably worse off, but, you know, it'd be, um, but uh, in, either, in either case, I think we'd all be worse off because he wouldn't have written all his wonderful books. Um, and all in all, I think the sentiments that move forefield anthropology as a holistic study of human beings um, and the, the study of what constitutes human happiness in different cultures, in different times, in different places, um, but overall recognizing the, the thread of continuity that goes through the human species, I think it just shows up a great deal in all of Vonnegut's writing um, and, all, and all of his other work. And, and really, I think we can leave it, you know, with, with thinking about the anthropological sentiment uh, that's in the words of Eliot Rosewater uh, in, in his book, God Bless You, Mr. Rosewater. Uh, his, uh, his instructions for life, uh, hello, babies, welcome to Earth. It's hot in the summer, cold in the winter, 
It's round and wet and crowded. At the outside, babies, you've got about 100 years here. And there's only one rule that I know of, babies. God damn it, you've got to be kind. That's, a, that's an interesting question that probably, uh, uh, unfortunately, uh, deals with my own, fault, my own failings in long-term memory. Um, but, you know, I, I mean, I started reading him in high school, as I'm sure many of you did. Um, and I, I, had the, I had the luck uh, that my advisor as an undergraduate, uh, uh, you know, knew, uh, is a graduate of University of Chicago, and. and had mentioned offhand at something about Vonnegut. And I should mention, thank you, Michael Harkin, uh, who, uh, who, who I, I emailed some time ago and asked for, uh, asked for some tips. Um, so, uh, so uh, you know, I think I always see it in there. And frankly, people, if you hang around with, with anthropologists uh, for, too, for too long outside the classroom, and especially if you go to a bar with them, they tend to be a pretty wry bunch. That'd be, um, but very well-meaning, very, very well-meaning. That'd be it's tremendous amounts of service and tremendous amounts of rye. Oh man! Uh, something, uh, yeah. That'd be, that'd be, um. I'm, I'm a big fan of Galapagos. Uh, I mean, that was the first one I read, so I guess, you know, that, that sort of, it has, it has a place in my life that way. Um, but also it, it has, it's very evolutionary. Uh, you know, he takes uh, Darwinian theory and extrapolates it, extrapolates it forward. Um, and actually, if, if one picks up uh, the Dan Wakefield book, there's some interesting uh, correspondence between uh, Vonnegut and Stephen Jay Gould about uh, hum about human evolution in there, which is pretty cool. Um, but uh, you know, I also you know who can't love Slaughterhouse Five? Anyway, uh, uh, and also uh, uh, Mother Night, was, uh, uh, which actually I think you know if you want to get if you want to talk about uh, anthropology and identity. Um, you know, I think uh, Mother Night begs all sorts of questions about what constitutes self. Um, in a in a cultural milieu, mm -hmm. yeah. and everything else. 